not, we can turn to Colossians chapter 4. Um, I just want to say again, thank you for having us. Thank you for your prayers for us. Um, the chest pains, the doctor said, I need to be less stressed. I was like, thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> so um, I'm working on that. But uh, anyway, on furlough here, we're definitely less stressed. And I was feeling better before we came back for furlough anyway. Um, I was trying to listen to the doctor and just not worry what I, about what I couldn't, do, uh, couldn't solve anyway. And so whether it's people or uh, people that are straying, whatever it was, just leave that with the Lord. That's, they're His people. They're not mine. And so uh, just pray for them and pray for us in the future. We'd like to go out and plant a church. Um, but with our coworkers, they're, they're going to step away from the church in September 2023. So just after we get back, almost just after we get back. Uh, so if there's no one to take over the church there, uh, if there's none of the men are willing to step up, if there's no one else, then we'll, we'll need to stay there with them, Lord willing, unless God just really makes it plain that, um, that we need to go out anyway. So just pray for us. That's a big burden. We don't know what God's doing, um, but He knows, and we just have to get in the step with Him. And as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tell us, we don't have to do what makes sense. We don't have to lean on our under, own understanding. We have to trust Him and let Him direct the path. So, so pray with us about that, if you would. Colossians chapter 4 and uh, we will read from verses 2 to 6, and I will invite you again to read with me, if you would, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Let's pray. Father, as we, as we come to your word now, we ask that you would help us to learn from it and help us to truly be able to devote ourselves to prayer, to be alert in it, to be thankful while we are praying, and that you would help us to see as we pray that we would see you opening doors uh, for us to witness that we could then have your wisdom to speak your word clearly and plainly. And I ask that you would give us wisdom. We need wisdom for our own daily lives, our own wisdom to know uh, what decisions you want us to make. We need wisdom to choose good and hate evil. We need wisdom also, though, to speak towards those who are unsaved. Lord Jesus, always uh, gave different people different parables, different words, different, uh, different passages from, from the Old Testament to think on, and I pray that you would help us to be able to do the same. Uh, when people walk away that they perhaps might reject, but would have to face the fact that they've interacted with you and with your word, and so we ask that you would do that work in our lives. We ask that you would bless your word now as, as it is preached, that you would Bless me as I try to speak it, that it would be clear and it would be plain itself, and that it would be uh, impactful in, in, in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I will have to apologize. If I make up English words that you've never heard before, I'm still struggling with English, so, so we'll, we'll try. But I want to just give you a quick uh, understanding of where we are in the book of Colossians. Uh, I'm just going to give you the second half, but you've come into chapter 3, and we're to seek those things um, that are above and set our affection on things above. And then he starts to tell you how to do that. He tells you to put off sin, to kill it, shake it off with disgust. And then he tells us to put on Christ's likeness. And this is all in chapter 3. And uh, he gives us a lot of uh, lists for how that looks. And then he starts keying in on how that looks in our private life. You come to chapter 3, verse 18. He starts in with the family, hus or wives, husbands, fathers, and then he comes into a more public uh, setting, servants, and then chapter 4, verse 1, masters. And so this is our private life. He is working to help us uh, change the way our, we live, to shake off sin in our private lives, to put on Christ-likeness in our private lives. But he comes now in chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, to really trying to perfect our prayer life or change our prayer life. And then in verse 5 and 6, you might say he's trying to perfect our public life. 
And then coming right back in verses 7 to 17, which we won't even touch today, uh, he's really trying to perfect one's personal life as well. And he starts naming names and telling you little bits and pieces about people who are ministering either with him or perhaps have strayed or are going to stray. And, and so we find out a lot. And so maybe we should start this question, this, this sermon by asking, why should we pray? I mean, so many people, they just think of prayer as a waste of time or something you do on the side. If you have time, uh, they think you should do everything else and then pray. But why should we pray? Well, uh, what, what should we pray for it would be another question. And this paragraph starts to answer that. Why we should pray, what we should pray for, tells us how we should act. But to give you some very quick answers from chapter 3 and chapter 4, we should pray so we don't fall. We have Mark and Demas mentioned in the later half of, verse, of chapter 4. Uh, Mark fell, but he was restored. Demas we don't know about. We know he fell. But we should pray. Jesus tells his disciples that. Pray that you enter not into temptation. We should pray that we could seek the heavenly. We should pray that God would help us to put off sin. Pray that God would help us put on Christ's likeness. Pray, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, that we would be filled with with the word. Pray for a clear witness, as we're going to see in a minute. Pray for good, salty, edifying speech. How to pray? Pray with thanksgiving and with gracious speech. You can maybe ask, why do people leave? Why do people leave the church? Why do people stop living for the Lord? What can we do about it? Well, they don't pray for themselves. Uh, perhaps someone says something that is ungracious or unsalty and they don't like it. And so we can pray and speak right. So what, what do we need to do? And I just have real, three very simple points uh, this morning because we don't have a lot of time, but we need to pray for ourselves, verse 2. We need to pray for our missionaries, verses 3 and 4. And we need to pray, you need to pray for your missionary opportunities, verses 5 and 6. And so verse 2, we come into it and he says, continue in prayer, watch in the same with thanksgiving. He uh, now is telling them to pray for themselves. He very clearly means for them to pray for themselves because in verse 3 he says, and pray also for us. Well, why would you say also? If you're starting with what you want them to do, then, then why would you say also? No, no, he's telling them, I want you to be praying. It's not enough for me to pray for you. He's already done that. Chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, really into verse 12. He has been praying for them, and it's a very rich and full prayer, and I won't try and get into it because I will never get to done with point one. But it's a very rich prayer. All right, It is very full. I would encourage you to memorize it and use it to guide your own prayers I do that a lot myself, um, and, and we do it as a family, but they must pray for themselves. It's not enough to have Paul praying for them. They need to pray for themselves. No matter how good Paul was at praying, no matter how long he could spend in prayer because he was in prison, they need to pray for themselves. Because the fact is, Jesus tells Peter to pray for himself. It wasn't enough for, Peter, for Jesus to pray for Peter. Peter. Jesus has already told Peter, Peter, the devil has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. But what's he say just a little bit later? He says, pray, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. What's Peter do? Sleep and rest so he enters into temptation. It's not enough to have Paul pray for you. It's not enough to have Pastor pray for you. It's not even enough to have Jesus praying for you, although God definitely hears his prayers and will answer. You need and I need to pray for ourselves. All right, and so we, we come to this. And we need to note that this is really is a present active imperative. It's something that they have to do, we have to do all the time. It's not optional. It is crucial. We must have it for Christian living and ministry. If Jesus, God's own Son, characterized his public and private life by prayer, how much more do we need to pray for the gospel, for ourselves, for one another? We need to pray. And we need to be devoted to prayer. It's, an, it's, it's really a formative process. We need to develop a discipline that we use time to pray, a commitment to prayer as central for the Christian life. And this kind of prayer life really comes from the Spirit helping us to pray. We, we need to guard against letting this, this uh, command here just be driven to only our private life. Uh, he, he is definitely telling us that we need to pray privately, but he, I think, as we look at this book in its, in its fullness, He's coming and, and he is telling us, I want you to pray publicly as a church, whether it's prayer meeting or in your own worship service, I want you to pray publicly. I would get that even more from 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he says, I want you to do what first? I want you to first pray. I mean, he tells us that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. I want you now to do one thing first, pray. 
All right, and so he wants us to pray personally, definitely, but he wants us to pray publicly as a church. He wants us to do that. And Paul not only practices a mature prayer life, he prescribes it for all believers. If we are going to persevere for Christ, we must pray. And so he says, I want you to devote yourself, continue in it, be devoted to, persist in your prayer. It's not a luxury, it's an essential for growth. It is as vital to your health as breathing is to your physical health. You must pray if you're going to survive. It should be continual, not casual. And, and not this passage, but another, First Thessalonians 5.18, where he tells us to, to pray without ceasing. It uses a, an interesting word that sometimes Greek doctors use to talk about a continual cough. You can't help coughing, right? And you should pray just as much as a sick person can't help coughing. It should be natural to you. And so he says, I want you to pray. And in your prayers, you should be watchful, alert, aware against spiritual drowsiness that would be caused by attention to the world. Jesus says that because of sin, the love of many will wax cold. But we need to be praying alertly, spiritually, and we need to be praying with thanks. Philippians 4, 6, I preached on it, actually it was a Sunday school lesson, somewhat recently, but it works. You know, he says, you don't want to be worried about anything, so pray about everything, but do it how? With thanksgiving, so that what? The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds. You can try it without prayer, without thanksgiving, and it really doesn't work so well. But when you just shut your mind off from your problems enough and start thanking God for all the things he has done, it's amazing how his peace really does Comfort your hearts and guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. And so Paul here tells us, I want you to be devoted to prayer. I want you to be alert in it, but I want you to be thanking God for what he's done. Praising him for sure, but thanking him for all the things he has done. What's the difference? Well, praising God is more about his person, his character. Thanking him is for what he's done. And you might go beyond what he's done in your life. I mean, there's many things he's done for us, and he's done an answer to prayer. But maybe we should start back with salvation. Maybe we should start with sending his son to die for us. His son whom Jesus said just before he died, I know you love me. And he sent him to have 30 miserable years as, as a pauper on this earth when he was a prince in heaven. Thank him for those things. Come on in to the things he's done for you for sure. But I'm just saying, start with the big things God has done. He says, I want you to continue, and I want you to be devoted to it. I want you to be steadfast in your prayer life. Don't quit. And so Colossians uh, yeah, 4 would tell us, if you don't want to fall away, pray for yourself. If you don't want to discourage others, pray for yourself. Colossians 3 would tell us, if you don't want to sin, pray for yourself. If you want to be Christ-like, pray for yourself. If you want to be a godly husband or wife, pray for yourself. If you want to be a godly child or parent, pray for yourself. If you want to be a godly co-worker uh, worker or boss, pray for yourself. That's all from Colossians 3. If you want Jesus to be preeminent in your life, that's Colossians 1 and 2. Pray for yourself. We must pray that God would help us to remember we died with Christ, we're buried with Christ, and rose with Him to new life. That's Colossians 1 and 2. We must pray that way because we forget. That's why we sin. We continue as slaves to sin instead of slaves to righteousness because we forget we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ in God. That's Colossians 3 verse 3. You are dead and your life is hid with, your Christ, with, with Christ in God. So devote yourself to prayer. Spend significant time doing it. Make it a priority. Spend time in it. Be alert in it. This also is present active is a present active participle. It's, it's an imperative, really. It's functioning that way because it takes planning, it takes persistence, and it takes vigilance. It has to be a lifestyle, not an event. Not something where, oh, I just, as I have time, I'll, I'll do it. When I think of it, I'll do it. it. It takes planning. You have to try. You have to be alert and guard it. You need to guard your prayer life because what happens when you're a little too busy? First, you pray a little less. Well, God will understand. And then you're a little more busy, and well, I'll... Pray a little less and read the Bible a little less. No, guard it. Be alert in it. Don't fall asleep physically while praying. Don't daydream while praying. I mean, how many things can you think of when you're praying, right? I mean, a thousand and one things come to mind that you need to do when you're praying, right? At least they do for me. Be alert in it. Stay alert. When you see a problem, you don't have to go into a long, detailed prayer about it. Pray about it. When you have a problem... 
pray about it. Immediately react with prayer. That's what Nehemiah did. I mean, he spends four months praying about this problem with the walls being down. And then every time he meets a problem, he prays. Meet the king, I pray. I have these people coming that are wanting to attack me, I pray. I have these people that are uh, um, slandering, I think is the word, yeah, slandering my ministry, pray. Remember them for all they've done to me and remember me for what I'm doing for you, Lord. I mean, pray. That's how he reacts to his problems. When you're on guard duty, if you're a, a soldier or, or some sort of police officer, if you're on guard duty, when you meet danger, you react with whatever weapon you've been trained with, whether it's an asp or a knife or a gun or whatever. Well, when you are in danger, react with prayer and instantly take it to God. But don't take it by asking Him alone, but pray with thanksgiving when times are tough, when sin is strong, when you don't know what to do, when you don't know who to believe. Thank God. Thank Him that He's gotten you this far. I mean, I've, I've thought much more about amazing grace. Through many dangers, toils, and strayers, I have already come. All right? He's gotten me this far. I've gone to uh, Ephesians 2 um, in recent months and said, you know what? You pulled me, when I was dead in trespasses and sins, you pulled me out and put my feet in a steady place on a rock. Now get me out of this too. <laughs> You've gotten me out of worse. So get me out of this too. Thank Him that He's gotten you this far. Thank Him that He'll get you through. Thank Him for Christ. Thank Him for salvation. Thank Him for knowing all about you and your problem. And so I just want to acknowledge very quickly uh, three quick things about this prayer. It's a battle. It's a mental, emotional, physical, spiritual battle, and you will feel exhausted. You will feel more tired when you're praying. You're more ready to go to sleep when you're praying than perhaps any other time. Because the mind's engaged, the heart's engaged, the will's engaged, everything is engaged, and it's a battle. But you also need to know it's a ministry. I remember that realizing this first when I was a teenager when my mom was sick with cancer, but I've realized it more and more and more and more. Over the, la over the past year and a half especially, but even all over those intervening years, that prayer is the most you can do for someone. It is the absolute most you can do. Perhaps after you pray, you can help them physically. Perhaps after you pray, you can do something. But prayer is the most you can do because it moves the hand of God. And then prayer brings victory. I mean, that's why he says pray with thanksgiving, reminding yourself of what God has already done Remembering that he can still do many things. Uh, one, one thing, just to, to give you a, a recent prayer request that God has blessed in, we were praying fervently for the last several months that God would help us to have uh, COVID-free tests or negative tests, whatever you call them, so that we could get on the plane to come back to America. We had to have that. America wouldn't let us in without them. And so we were praying, like, Lord, just keep us healthy. We really want to get on that plane really bad. And we don't want to get caught here because then we're going to have to be quarantined in a hotel and that's going to be a big hassle and headache. And so we were well. And just this week, we've only been gone a couple weeks. And just this week, people in our church started texting, hey, we're sick. <laughs> like, well, we're praying for you that you'll get better. But praise the Lord, we made it out before we got sick. <laughs> All right. And, and I'm not saying that heartlessly about our friends there. I'm saying that prayer works. God answers prayer. Verses 3 and 4, though, pray for your missionaries. He says, praying also for us. And remember, well, maybe I shouldn't say remember, you should know from Colossians 1 and also Colossians 2 that Paul didn't know these people, so perhaps they wouldn't call him a, their own missionary in that sense. But, but for someone that's out preaching the word, or in this case imprisoned and preaching the word, uh, he asked them to pray for him as well. But I want to note that Paul does not ask for prison doors to be opened. He could have asked them to pray for that. But he asked that doors of ministry might be opened instead. He was something like John Bunyan who said, If you let me out today, I will preach the gospel tomorrow. That's what the judge said. Just, just go out and don't preach. And we'll let you go. And he says, No, I won't do it. And I want to note this as well. I don't know, perhaps you've heard this growing up. Uh, this prayer acrostic. Oh, goodness. Ten minutes. <clears throat> I'll go. Your prayer across is joy, Jesus, other, you. Well, this one's different, all right? You, Jesus, others, you. That's how this, this acrostic goes that, that Paul gives us. You, verse 2. Jesus, as we're going to thank him in verse 2. And then he's going to pray for others, verse 3 and 4. And then he's going to pray again for you. And so he wants them to pray for themselves. He wants them to thank God. He wants them to pray for others who are sharing Christ. 
And so he tells them what to pray for for those who are trying to share Christ. And that would apply to all of us who are trying to share Christ, all right? So don't just think of, of my family at all. Anyone who's trying to share Christ with others, you should pray for them this way. And so that would probably include yourself, Lord willing. I mean, that's what all Christians should be doing. So pray for open doors for the Word. I mean, have you ever had really good opportunities and really lousy opportunities? I mean, we've had them both. Some people really are willing to listen, even if they're not willing to, to trust. Pray for those open doors, and then pray for wisdom to speak the mystery of Christ. I mean, have you ever tried to explain the virgin birth or the resurrection to someone? It's not possible, and it's really hard. And they're going to have to have faith and grace to believe. You cannot explain it to them. It's impossible. You need grace to speak the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. Yeah, he's fully God, always existed, and he became a man. Yeah, they're not going to get it. Not unless God has, uh, gives them faith and grace to believe and he gives you wisdom to share. You need clarity of speech in English. and I won't even try to say the language of Ethiopia, but still, you need wisdom and clarity to share. And you, but seriously, you need open doors. That open door was set before Paul in Rome. And he has an opportunity, and he is now speaking the mystery of Christ. I mean, he now wants to speak about Christ. If you were wanting to speak about Abraham, most people would probably listen. If you want to speak about Joseph, it's even easier. But you want to speak about Jesus, and it's a hard thing to talk about with people. People are willing to talk about almost anything else from the Bible except Jesus Christ. My grandpa likes to say, people love God but hate Jesus Christ. That might not be completely true, but they're much more willing to talk about a general God than they are about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so he's speaking about this to them. I'm going to skip so I can keep going. But he has all they need. He is their wisdom and knowledge. Uh, he is our wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. He is in all Christians, 127. He's preeminent, 124. Yet he allows bad things in the world. That takes a lot of wisdom. And so Paul wants opportunities. Paul's going to have to, or God's going to have to give them because... God's going to bring guards to him to hear. He's going to bring prisoners to him to hear. He's going to bring freemen to them to hear, if you want to cross-reference uh, Acts, the end of Acts. And that's for Paul who's in prison. And for us who are not in prison, we're no different. God still has to give the opportunities. And he has to give clear speech. And Paul wants to preach Christ freely. He wants to preach Christ truly. And he wants to preach Christ clearly. And those are all from verses 3 and 4. So... I'm sorry to skip and move so fast, but pray for your missionary opportunities. Pray for your missionary opportunities. I said how you're supposed to be praying for missionaries, and you're one of them if you're a son or daughter of, of God. And so you need to practice the wisdom you pray for. And so he says, conduct yourselves. He tells us how we're supposed to live. Conduct yourselves in wisdom. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. And so he gives them some general instructions. They're supposed to be wise in the way they speak to outsiders so that they're not turned off, but they're attracted. And we're going to have to be careful in our conduct. There was a man who became president of Chicago's Moody Bible Institute. And for a time, someone in town hired a private detective to follow him and report on his conduct. And after several weeks, this detective reported that that, man, that man's life matched his preaching. And as a result... The man that hired the detective became a Christian. We need to make sure that our conduct matches what we're saying. So we need to act in wisdom, and we need to speak to them in wisdom. This is for all Christians. We've just said that the people he's just recently talked to was husbands, wives, children, fathers, servants, and masters. And if you're not one of those, you're dead, right? If you're one of those, or maybe two or three of them. And so these are the people that he says, I want you to walk in wisdom and I want you to speak in wisdom. I want you to walk graciously and speak graciously. I want you to portray the wisdom of God to them. That's verses three, to, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, which is the, the, the word of Christ. And it's chapter 1, verse 9, where you're praying for the wisdom of God. You're wanting to live a life that is pleasing to God, worthy of Him, Colossians 1, 10, and be fruitful. That really sums up walking in wisdom and speaking graciously. But he says, I want you to redeem the time because you don't have lots of it. But also, we were suddenly meeting people that we hadn't been able to meet. We'd never met before. We met them through birds. Uh, and, and then that, that led to other relationships and 
people were opening their hearts and lives to us and we could talk to them about Christ and make relationships to them and we knew we were leaving in just a few weeks. It was frustrating. So make the most of your opportunities. You don't know how long you've got. Even if we'd stayed, we might not still be able to talk to them because of new restrictions. Make the most of it. Don't say, well, I want to establish a friendship first and then next time I'll tell them this and the time. Forget it. You might not have next time. You don't have to give them the Romans road. Tell them what you learned in your devotions. Tell them what you learned at church. Tell them something, though. Speak to them. Redeem the time. Buy it back. Use it well. And, and this Filipino lady, uh, that she, she worked with us, and uh, she uh, really was a great bargainer. I mean, she could buy more stuff for less money than anybody in the world, I'm quite sure. It was frustrating. You didn't even want to talk to her after she bought stuff because she would go buy the same thing as you and she paid nothing for it. It's like, don't even tell me. Don't tell me. Don't, don't speak. But she was awesome with that. She was good at redeeming her money, if I can say it that way. But she was also good at redeeming the time. She was there to serve the Lord and she told everyone she knew about, about the Lord Jesus. And she didn't know that she was going to suddenly die of an asthma attack in her apartment. And, and this was about a couple years ago. And I was the lucky, actually a little more than that, but I was the lucky one that had to tell the friend that was supposed to meet her for lunch, hey, you're not going to meet her for lunch today. And I was like, no, I'm meeting her for lunch. She said, no, you're not. And you're not a Christian yet either. And you need to think about it because this could happen any time. And that's eventually what helped him to get saved. So many people suddenly died around him that he's like, okay, this is serious. I need to think about this. But we have to redeem the time. That lady didn't know she had just a few short days or hours left. She fully expected to meet our friend for lunch and tell him more about Jesus. Redeem the time. Buy it back. Use it well. Take full advantage of each opportunity so that you can be fruitful in every good work. Colossians 1.10. That's what Paul prays. So be wise in the way you act. Or outsiders, make the most of every opportunity. Speak graciously. Remember Jesus says... Uh, Luke 4 tells us that he spoke gracious words and everyone was marveling and saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Speak gracious words that would cause people to think. And remember Jesus as he was the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could see his grace and his truth. So why do you salt, salt things? Well, for taste. Jesus had the right parable, the right verse to attract his hearer's attention. Pray for that wisdom. You salt for purifying. Jesus used the right verse to rebuke those in sin. Pray for that wisdom and for the boldness to go with this because sometimes it's scary to say it, right? Pray for the preserving influence that salt has. Jesus always used the right verse and parable to comfort. Pray for that wisdom because you need it and I need it. And that way, you too will know how to answer every person. Paul was talking to two or three-year-old Christians or less. And he says, I expect you to share the gospel. I expect you to fully explain it. I expect you to, know how, you to know how to answer each person. I mean, sure, while you're witnessing, if you have a question you can't answer, you can always call your pastor, but maybe you could pray about it first and say, "What well, God, what verse do, should I answer that with? It's kind of amazing what he'll do when you ask that. He'll give you a lot of verses that will surprise you. Don't do it in your own strength. Don't do it in your own wisdom. Do it in God's and get it through prayer. So Saul, Paul says, pray. He doesn't say read your whole Bible first. He doesn't say go to seminary first. He says pray. Pray for yourselves. Pray for your missionaries. Pray for your own evangelistic efforts. If God can give a prisoner opportunities, he can give a free person opportunities. If he can give a prisoner opportunities in a different language, he can give us opportunities in our own language. If you're going to give a prisoner opportunities in a different language, he can give you opportunities. If he can you bring prison guards to him, that's Philippians where we see some guards were saved. If he can bring prisoners to him, we see that Onesimus was saved. We see that from Colossians 4 and the book of Philemon. If God can give a prisoner opportunities, he can give them to you. He brought free men from the outside, Acts 21 to 28, just so Paul could speak to them. So pray. And pray for the wisdom to know what to share and the clarity to share it. And so the questions are these. Will you pray? Will you pray alertly? Will you devote yourself to prayer? Will you pray with thanksgiving? 
Will you pray for your missionaries the way God or God commands, or I could say Paul? And I say that, I guess, to say, don't just pray that we be blessed. We want to be blessed, trust me. But we also want to see fruit. You want to see fruit, so pray this way. And will you pray for your own opportunities as Paul commands? Let's pray. Father, as we look at this text, Lord, we understand that you are the Lord of the harvest. You are the one who thrust, thrusts out laborers into this harvest. You are the one that draws people to yourself, according to Jesus in John 6. We can't do that work of drawing. We can't give grace and faith. We can't even give ourselves wisdom to know what to say. We can read your word and try and fill ourselves with it, but we cannot make opportunities and we cannot change people's hearts. Lord, we struggle for our own selves to live like sanctified people should. And we certainly cannot help others to see the glorious light of the gospel unless you tear away the veil that Satan has over their eyes. So help us, Lord. Help us to know what to say and have the grace to say it in a way that would be salty to them. We ask that you would help us to have opportunities, and we pray that you would uh, help us to take advantage of them, of them. We thank you for the many ways that you have given us to reach out and to share Christ with others, and we ask that you give us more in Jesus' name.